Speaking of home, NFL decision makers are at home, and it is man cave slash draft war room time to check out what everybody has. John Elway's set up. John Lynch's set up with the five screens, the computer, the two phones. Tom Telesco of the Los Angeles Chargers, and we got something on them later on in the show. Dave Gettleman a little more bare bones. He kind of old school, fits Dave Gettleman a little bit. Same deal with Andy Reid down in the basement. Tammy, his wife, has brought over that antique table. You've got everybody set up for how their draft setup's going to look on Thursday. And speaking of at home, Paul Burmeister, our NBC Sports colleague who's on Chris Sims' podcast with him, has talked a bunch of NFL, radio voice of Notre Dame football, our coverage of the Tour de France, Olympic coverage as well. Paul does it all, and he joins us from his at-home setup Paul, I'm kind of jealous of John Lynch and those guys. How great would it be to have a sweet setup like that uh, for the draft and all of our work prep in general? I think one thing we've all found is it's nice to be at home. And just a couple minutes ago, as you and I were talking, I heard a voice of your daughter in the background, and we didn't see any of their kids in those pictures of GMs, but I'm sure that they're enjoying the same thing. Once you get settled into being at home, it's been really nice to have the kids in the periphery uh, to help, to hand you something, to see what you do. So uh, a, a bit of a challenge for sure. Uh, but we're all enjoying having our kids and family nearby. Yeah, and, and the dinnertime conversations as well, especially for those of us with older kids. It has been a blast. Paul, I want to dive into the draft. And I mentioned all the things you do as a host and a play-by-play -play person for NBC Sports, including help out during the hockey coverage as well. But I, I need to lean on your training, high school and college. Paul was a successful and starting quarterback at Iowa, took Iowa to a bowl game, uh, was in an NFL camp, went to the scouting combine after his senior year. So I'm sure your eyes have keenly been on the quarterbacks in preparation for Thursday's draft. That's why I enjoy listening to you and Chris Sims on the podcast break some of the quarterback stuff down. What have you noticed? I want your observations, not Sims. I hear enough of him. I want your <laughs> observations of how you see this quarterback class coming into Thursday's draft. Well, first of all, Mike, you're right. This is uh, right in my wheelhouse in terms of how much fun it is this time of year. Uh, my first thoughts are, are with that first pick, and it's one we've kind of all bypassed because we just assume the Bengals are going to take Joe Burrow. Uh, but I think it's as interesting a pick in, in round one, not because of the element of the unknown, but because are they going to get the Joe Burrow that we saw on tape this last year? Uh, the ability to have so few poor decisions to know where to go with the football uh, seemingly each and every time and then throw with accuracy. I can't wait to see if that's the guy that shows up for them uh, as season one and season two plays out, no matter how season one comes. Then as far as the decision in the quarterback world right now, do you like Justin Herbert? Do you like Tuo Tungavailoa? And I'm fascinated by this process. And I know from being around it for years, Mike, just like you, and listening to evaluators and GMs, they like safe. They like to, to be able to, right. to cover themselves, to have something they know they can go back and say, well, I chose the more talented guy. And I think this injury with Tua and the team's right. lack of ability to get time with him is going to lead whoever takes that second quarterback to taking Justin Herbert over Tua. And what have you seen in Herbert as you've evaluated him? I've seen a guy that I love to watch. When the first time I watched him, probably three or four years ago, Mike, there at Oregon, you know how it is. You see a lot of these players, and they all kind of look the same, even the really talented ones after a while. But sometimes you see someone make a throw or make a catch or show some acceleration where you're like, whoa, that was different. And I think Justin Herbert has that different kind of talent. Uh, he makes everything look easy. There's a real ease with the tough throws and the touch throws, the lob, the darts, no matter what it is. And you can question the anticipation. And he's a different type of leader. His personality isn't what a lot of people are looking for as a quarterback. But there's so much talent there, upper body and lower body, that I think he is going to be the second guy. Paul, that's going to be a very interesting rookie year for these quarterbacks because usually teams would have had a little bit better feel for them, whether it's the injury or just having them in their meeting rooms and their facilities in the lead up to the draft. And then right away, get them in, get them in for a rookie mini camp, get them in for the OTAs. That's not going to happen. I'm just wondering your perspective. The expectations for this class almost have to come down a little bit because it's going to be a much harder learning curve, I feel, for these guys coming in. That's a great point. And it's going to be a real test to how to a different way all these guys can learn. Uh, can they learn and then eventually apply it to the field 
with what they, what you and I are doing right now? Can they have this kind of session with the quarterback coach and offensive coordinator without the warmth and the engagements and just looking at a screen? Can they take that and apply it to whenever they show up to camp? It, it's a different kind of skill. It's something they've never had to do in college. And it's something that they're going to have to do uh, coming up here whenever they are allowed to get back to work. And I, I think about these GMs, Mike, and I always like to relate it to things that we know and mm -hmm. things that you and I do. And like, what if the last thing you did those last couple of days in preparation for calling a game was taken away from you? The finishing touch that really allowed you to walk into that right. booth with conviction, you don't get that this next season. Right. And that's what these general managers are dealing with right now. They don't get that last bit of confidence and feel by putting their hands on and the interaction with them one-on-one. -on -one. And I think we can all think of a scenario professionally where that would be awfully tough if it was in our world. It's a really good point, Paul. And when we had Michelle Tafoya on last Wednesday, I think it was, Michelle brought that same point up. I mean, and we all try to look at it from our world and try to extrapolate what it's gonna mean elsewhere. Uh, we, we may be in a very different world in terms of visiting facilities, the time we spend with players, the time that you and I sitting next to each other in South Bend spend talking to Brian Kelly and players on a Friday before a Notre Dame home football Saturday. Those things, as you said, kind of put the pieces of the puzzle completely together. Without that, you feel a little incomplete. And, and you're right. I, I bet a lot of the GMs are going on more of their gut instinct than maybe they could have before because they haven't had that hour across the table from these draft picks. Uh, I want to hit you on the wide receivers, because in addition to watching the quarterbacks, you've seen some of the guys they're throwing to. Uh, this really seems like a loaded wide receiver class. Uh, obviously, the proliferation of passing in, in college football helps that. Anyone from that group that has caught your eye as you've been preparing? I find the most interesting, the most intriguing decision there, Mike, is not with the top two. I mean, it's likely going to be C.D. Lamb, Jerry Judy, in some form after we get past that 10th pick. Uh, but let's say you're San Francisco at 13, and we all know that their signature was the strength of that defensive line they built with those first-round picks. And there will be chances to take a player like that. But I think of the 49ers, Mike, I think of the fourth quarter of the Super Bowl when they couldn't score a touchdown. What if they had Henry Ruggs, right. the right. fastest wide receiver in this draft, and they utilized that? Can you imagine Kyle Shanahan with that player on his offense, with that piece to move around? So that's uh, when it comes to wide receivers, CeeDee Lamb, Jerry Judy, they'll be great. Who gets Henry Ruggs, and how much do the 49ers pause when they have a chance to take him? Because I think they will. Last 30 seconds or so, I mentioned Notre Dame. You've called the Notre Dame games on radio the last couple of years. The, really, their broadcast, which is a national broadcast. How much have you enjoyed being back in the college atmosphere week in, week out? It's been fantastic, Mike, and I haven't been around the NFL games as much as you, but you know there's a difference. They're, they're both wonderful. We love to be in either place. But when you're on campus and the stadium is full and the band is there and when you're at a meaningful game every single Saturday, uh, it's, it's like we're stealing. There's nothing else like it. So I know you're on the other side of the stadium as me on those uh, Saturdays in South Bend, but I have often looked over and seen the bright light over there and thought, I know there's one guy over there who's feeling the exact same way about this that I do, and that's just that we're lucky yeah. to be here. It, it is a blast, and it's been a lot of fun. Paul, glad the family's healthy and doing okay. Stay safe. I uh, look forward to watching you on the podcast and listening to you with Chris Sims, and we'll talk to you down the road, buddy. Mike, good to talk to you. Thanks for having me on. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.